Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi samir alim minash shaytan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa la udwana illa ala al-zalimeen. Wa la'aqibatu al-muttaqeen. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala abdika wa rasulika Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Um, so I've never done this before in terms of uh, switching the topics on the stage. And um, those of you who know me, I kind of, I usually get a little bit harsh on the speakers that do. But honestly, I just, subhanAllah, listening to uh, Stad Nu'man speak had a lot of um, influence on me. SubhanAllah, when he's talking about this concept of the father-son relationship, and you know what? When we're talking about that, we really do kind of need to balance the equation. Um, I'm not Pakistani, so I can't take shots at Pakistani fathers. But your reputation hasn't fared very well today. <laughs> but you know what? SubhanAllah, it's, it's absolutely true that the parents need to reach out. And you know, one incident struck me while he was speaking. This was the most powerful incident that I've ever witnessed in my short career as Imam. Last six years, a father walks into my office with his daughter. His daughter is 18 years old. She drives a Lexus. She refuses to call him dad, right? Now, just like what Ustad Nu'man said, when, when, when he walks in with her, Obviously, the first thing is just, you know, obviously he's just berating her, going off on her. What kind of daughter is this? Didn't she read this in the Qur'an? Didn't she read that in the Qur'an? Basically giving her the advices that he feels like I should give her. And obviously she hated me from the start. But you know what, subhanAllah, she said something to him that changed my life forever. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to allow me to fall into this with my own daughter. Because one of the arguments that he was making was that, I bought you your car. I gave you everything you wanted. When you were a child, everything that you asked for, you got. If your friends wanted something and you just implied that you wanted it, I bought it for you too. And you know what she said? She said, Dad, I didn't want all of that. I just wanted a dad. SubhanAllah. Those words struck me. And I mean, I, I, can't, I cannot illustrate how much I truly felt you know, the need for us to show compassion to our children. But you know what, there's the other side of the equation too. And yes, the topic was eyes on the prize. And honestly, what I had in mind, you know, when I was talking about eyes on the prize is all of these elaborate ahadith and the shi'ar of Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah and those types of things. But there's something that I feel like needs to be connected to Brother Nu'man's talk. And I actually took permission from the, from the, uh, the program coordinators right before just now. And I took permission from Brother Nu'man too, to talk about the other side too. Not just for Pakistani parents, but for every, every set of parents. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stresses to us so many times in the Qur'an the importance of birrul walidain, obeying, honoring, respecting our parents. And Imam al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says something very interesting. When we're talking about how you raise your kids and what you should do when you raise your kids and listening to them and those types of things, and Imam al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he starts off his dialogue, on the, his, his discussion on this subject by saying the following. He says that if you have a child that's disobedient to you, the asl, the default, is usually that you messed up. Let me put it to you this way. Not every single, par not every single parent who has a disobedient child is at fault. Not every single parent who has a child that grows up to, with, with, with this horrible temper, that grows up not to love the deen the way that they did, is at fault. Nuh alayhi salam is the primary example of that. But the vast majority of the time that is the case. And Imam al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created a, every single human being in a very selfish way. We treat everyone essentially like, like HMOs, like it's a business contract. What I want to do when I establish a friendship, when I establish any relationship in this life, is I want to extract maximum benefit from you while giving you the minimum just like an insurance company. I want you to give me as much as you can, and every relationship I will put in that same light. How much do I get from you and how much do I have to give? Whenever that equation tilts the other way, then all of a sudden I'm gonna start acting differently. Let me put it to you this way. Have you ever had a friend that did something really good for you, that was there for you in your time of need? But whenever it came time for them, 
when they were in, when they were in a state of emotional vulnerability and they kept on calling your phone, eventually you just got sick of it and you said, I'm not going to answer this call anymore. This is getting draining. This relationship is draining. Even though at your time of need, they were there for you. But this relationship is draining. I can't handle this anymore. You stop answering your phone. You start avoiding that person in public. Why? Because you're no longer on the receiving end. You're too far on the giving end now. And Rasulullah tells us what? Man la yashkur nas. He doesn't thank Allah. Whoever does not thank people, is not grateful to people, will never be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But listen to what Imam al-Qayyim rahimahullah said that's so beautiful. He said that that hadith can also be flipped. Whoever is not grateful to people will not be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just like whoever is not grateful to people will not be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whoever is not grateful to Allah will never be grateful to people. Think about that for a moment. A lot of times parents come and they say, how can I make my children love me? What is going to keep your child in your corner? What is going to keep your child loving you? And coming, you know, responding to every one of your requests when the time comes where you are the one who needs your diapers changed. When you now need to be, when you are now in the dependent phase. What will keep them in that state except for being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Understanding the command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To, res to respond with that same mercy with even greater mercy and compassion. So Imam al-Qayyim rahimahullah puts it point blank. You want your kids to be good to you? You want your kids to never forsake you? Teach them to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Teach them to be thankful to Allah. Teach them to be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you can succeed in instilling in them the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they get older, they're going to love you too. Because Allah commands them to do that. Otherwise, it's just going to be a business relationship. Otherwise, my sense of courtesy to you is putting you in the best nursing home available. But I don't want you anywhere near me because you're a drain on me now. That's the most hurtful thing that a parent can hear later on in life. When the kids neglect them. Now coming back to the kids. And by the way, when I say kids, I mean all of us are kids. Sometimes your parents are very, very, very irrational. Sometimes your parents will actually make mistakes when you get older. But you know what? That's not the default. And even when they make mistakes, you have to be able to have a memory that spans longer than two weeks. And subhanAllah Azim, one of the major things, you know, sometimes we have this situation where I once had a, uh, a parent and a child come to me and they were disputing over something. And the child had the right with them. The haq was with the child. He, he knew what he was doing in that situation. He had the Qur'an, he had the Sunnah, he had all the proof with him. And the parent was wrong. And he came with his father and he humiliated his father in front of me. And I was like, you know what? You might have won this debate. You might have won this argument. But how many times in the past were you wrong? How many times were you completely irrational? And your parents put up for it, with it, out of love for you. Now there was a commercial that I saw once, and I think it's a Turkish commercial, I couldn't understand the language. But subhanAllah, it was a very powerful commercial. And have any of you ever heard the, have any of you ever seen that video, that clip on YouTube, of the father sitting with the son, and the bird is flying around? Raise your hand if you've seen that. It's an extremely powerful video. So the father and the son are sitting down with each other. The son is reading a book. And there is a bird, a sparrow, that's flying around. So the dad goes, what's that? And he goes, a sparrow. And then the bird flies around again and he goes, what's that? He says, it's a sparrow. Then the bird flies around again and he says, what's that? He says, it's a sparrow. And then he spells it out, I guess, in their language, S-P-A, you know, uh, he spells it out in their language, double R-O-W, just in case he thought I couldn't spell. <laughs> I did have to think about it for a moment, I'm not going to lie though. <laughs> it's a sparrow. Then he asks for a fourth time, what's that? And his son starts to yell at him, starts to scream at him, why are you doing this? What's your problem? Can't you see that it's a bird? Can't you see that it's a sparrow? What does the dad do? The dad gets up and leaves. Then he comes back later on and he brings a book. He hands the book to his son. Wallahi, this brought tears to my eyes. I mean, this video, like, it really hit me because I reflected on my own childhood. 
He handed him the book and he pointed to it and he said, read out loud. So he read out loud and that was the diary of his father. And the father was writing, today I took my little boy to the park. He asked me while a sparrow was flying by, what's that 21 times? Every time he asked me, I responded to him and I didn't get angry with him. And I picked him up and I hugged him. SubhanAllah, think about that for a moment. What happened? What happened? Where is the rahmah? Where is the mercy? Where is the compassion? Where is the appreciation? And yes, sometimes now when you've gotten old and your parents have moved on and, and you've moved on and you're trying to progress in your life and your parents are getting old and senile. And by the way, you make them senile before they actually turn senile. Sometimes at that situation, yes, they're wrong. Sometimes, you know, this son, this daughter wants to get married to somebody. And they have perfect justification to get married. Now, by the way, as a side note, the parents that stop their kids from, from getting married to people because of race, because of class, because, because that person's grandfather didn't ride a donkey with my, per, with my grandfather in India or in Palestine or something like that. What did Rasulullah say would happen as a result? If someone comes to you, deen and khuluq, his character are satisfying to you, you better marry your daughter to that person. If you don't do that, what's going to happen? There will be fitna, tests, tribulations, and fasad, lots of corruption. That corruption is not talking about hundreds and hundreds of years from now. That corruption is talking about now. Because everything is balanced, right? I had a hafza of Qur'an. Hafza of Qur'an who wanted to marry a brother for his deen. Father stepped in the way and stopped. Why? Because he was Palestinian and she was from Pakistan. It's not going to happen. You know what happened to that girl? She left him and she left the deen. And she ran off with a kafir. Fasad, it shows. But now let's, that's an extreme example. I'm talking about son, Daughter, when you want to get married, when you found someone who excites you, when you find some, when you found someone who you're you're in love with, and oh, they're so perfect, and oh, mashallah, she's so religious, she prays five times a day, mashallah, she's so you know she fasts Ramadan even when she's on her period, you know, it's like all kinds of weird stuff. Where do you come from? And subhanallah, when you when you're in love, when you're infatuated, you'll make that person religious even if they're not religious. Sometimes brothers will be coming up to me like, Sheikh, I found the perfect girl. Really? Oh man, she loves Allah so much. She's wonderful. All she t when we talk on the phone all night, we only talk about deen. <laughs> all right. Okay, fine. Now what happens? Imam Al-Qayyim rahimahullah said something beautiful. He said, it is amazing that the human being is so forgetful. وَمَا سُمِّيَ الْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا لِنَسْيِهِ As Imam al-Shafi rahimahullah said, he was not named insan except for his forgetfulness. It's so amazing that he would be able to forget a relationship that started with his existence for 20, 30 years and forsake that relationship in favor of a two-month relationship. Unbelievable. I'm not talking about the extreme example. Mom, dad, you step in the way and you stop your kids from getting married to a person because of some racist reason or because of something that's, that's not because of deen and khuluq, you're going to pay the price. I'm telling you that from now, no matter what I say here. But I'm appealing to the children now. How many times have I had kids come up to me? I can't, I can't, I cannot count. It says, Shaykh, you know, in the Hanafi fiqh, the wali doesn't really count. First of all, that's a misconception. <laughs> in the Hanafi fiqh, the wali doesn't matter. I don't need the wadi's approval. Or Sheikh, I'm the son. I don't need anybody's approval. I'm the man in this house. You know what Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu did? He saw his son, Abdullah, in love with his wife, started missing out on halaqa, started missing out on going to battle, and he said, divorce her. He divorced her. <laughs> Then he came back to him and he said, okay, you can marry her again. I just wanted to teach you a lesson. That's Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Where is your gratefulness? Which relationship counts more? Again, parents are many times guilty. But I'm talking about the brother who has a whole sea of sisters. The sister who has a whole sea of brothers. And there are plenty of fish in the sea. 
There are plenty of hijabis in the masjid. There are plenty of bearded men in the masjid too. You can find somebody that you want and, you and fulfills your criteria. No, it's got to be that one. Because you established the haram relationship, you're paying the price and your parents will probably pay the price too. Don't give up a relationship of 20 years, 30 years, because somebody excited you over a few months. Think about this. Go back as far as you can. And what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remind us of? I want you to think about this. Does Allah tell us in the Qur'an to love our mother only, our father only, or both of our parents? Both, right? And in fact, I remember Brother Nu'man did a very beautiful uh, analysis of this. The difference between walidain and ub and ab. Walidain is someone who gives birth to you. Um or ab is someone who actually had a part in being your mother and father. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded you to have honor, to show honor to who? Both of your parents, the ones that gave you birth to, even the ones that you don't like, even the one that didn't get you a PlayStation when you wanted it. Show them respect. Show them love. But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say next? Hamalatu ummu. His mother held him. Wahan ala wahan. In another place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, kurha. وَوَضَعَتْهُ كُرْهَا Pain on top of pain. Holding him in pain. Giving birth to him in pain. Going through all of that. She already acquired the right to be your umm. She already acquired the right to be your mother and to be loved and respected. If she does nothing else for you for the rest of your life, she already has enough of a right on you. If she does nothing else for the rest of her life, she should. She'd be a bad mother if she doesn't, but she's still your mother. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what? He mentions specifically the toil that she went through. Why? Because you weren't there. You were there, but you didn't really know what was going on. You don't have a video camera. Imagine if our, if our mothers carried cameras around for nine months. Every single cry, every single scream in labor, everything that happened afterwards, all the depression that comes afterwards, all of that hardship, when they literally give their life for your life. Imagine if there was a video camera for all of that. And you watch that. You might feel pretty rotten at the end of that. But the point is, dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of that in the Qur'an. Meaning what? Allah is giving you your history. Just in case you forgot. This was the woman that carried you. Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, a man approached him. Some, most scholars say the hadith is mawquf to Abdullah ibn Umar. Some say Rasulullah sallallahu A man comes to him what? He says, I carried my mother on my back. Throughout Hajj, think about that for a moment. That's before they had all the cooling tiles. That's before they had the spoiled Americans, including us, who go there and whine about the buffets not having enough variety. And the AC and all this, you know, the article that just came out that said Mecca looks more like Las Vegas now. That's before that. Before that. That's when standing on that ground would burn your feet. You know, my father, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him, he moved to Medina in the 50s. He used to tell me in Hajj, they were just doing this in Salah the whole time. <laughs> That's when it was hot. Imagine back then. And what was the answer? Have I repaid my mother? Not even for one shout in labor. You think that's a big deal? Try holding someone in your stomach for nine months. And then giving birth to them. <laughs> you think that's hard? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, give them back at least what they gave you. At least show them the same love and respect that they showed to you. Then you go to the lives of the, the, the Salaf, the Tabi'een, you see some beautiful examples. Zainul Abideen, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Ali ibn al Hussein, the great grandson of the Messenger, وسلم, and his nickname was Zainul Abideen, the beauty of the worshippers. SubhanAllah, look at this khuluq. One day he's sitting with his mother and they're eating food. And he brings the food and he puts it and he sits in front of her. And he doesn't want to eat until she finishes eating. Think about that. He says, you eat first. You finish your food first. She says, go ahead, eat. Eat, oh my son, eat with me. He says, no, you eat first. He says, I don't want to touch anything that your eye might have fallen on. Think about that. Why is he saying that? When you're a child, let me put you in this situation. If Baba brings home a box of pizza, 
and you're starving and you haven't had anything to eat all day. I'm talking specifically to the mothers right now and I'm talking to the kids who should remember this, by the way. And there is one slice of pizza left after all the kids come and tear it up like monsters. And the mother waits till the end. And it's not just the Pakistani father. I'm going to let you guys off the hook. We eat much more than our wives usually. We're very inconsiderate even with food sometimes, right? One slice of pizza left. Just as she's about to take a bite, if the child goes, ah! what are you going to do, mom? Are you going to say, no, I'm hungry. You ate two slices already. What are you going to do? Here, take it. No hesitation. No hesitation. So now when you've gotten older, show that same love and respect. You know, we were talking about the concept of marriage. Does anyone know what age Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, got married at? You know, we get really impatient at 20 years old. At 20 years old, it's like, Mom, Dad, if I don't get married now, I'm going to go commit zina. I promise. See that girl on the street? I'm going I'm to do it. And the parents, of course, make, again, balance. They make it very, very, very hard to get married because you have to be a 32-year-old Hyderabadi dermatologist to marry my daughter. Or a 29-year-old, you know, plastic surgeon from Ramallah in Palestine to marry my... No. But Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, and he said this isn't sunnah. He said it clearly. He said, look, you guys don't listen, don't think I'm doing this out of sunnah. He refused to get married till his mom passed away. He said, because if I get married before she passes away, I won't give her her right. He told his students, it's not sunnah. You get married, but I can't do it. Subhanallah, till his late 30s. And it wasn't like whenever she passed away, he was like, alhamdulillah, she's gone, I can get married now. No, no. Even when he went to look for a wife, his aunt Maimuna, she asked him, what should we look for? And he said, a woman that resembles my mom. SubhanAllah, that's love. Showing it back, showing it back, giving back that mercy, giving back that love. They were there for you. You should be there for them too. And SubhanAllah, in this society which only feasts upon those, those, those feelings where we really just don't care, SubhanAllah, they get older and we lose it. Let me tell you something. I lost my mother four years ago. The worst time of my life. And anyone who tells you that it's going to get easier was lying to you. Any, anyone who tells you that crying makes you feel better was lying to you. It's the toughest thing that you could ever do. Toughest thing that you could ever go through is burying, the per, burying that person at the time of death. But you know what I've observed in most janazas? You know which, which people are usually crying the most at janazas? Let's say that a woman has six kids. You know which kids are going to be the ones crying most at the janazah going, Oh, mama, come back. Who does that? The kids that treated them like trash when they were living. And then if their dads are living still, they go do the same thing to their dads even after that. They didn't learn the lesson. Or as Zayd ibn Thabit radiallahu ta'ala anhu when his mother passed away, he cried and he said, One of my gates of Jannah has been closed. Woe to me if I don't rush to the other one. Think about this. You're in a room and there is only two gates to Jannah. One of them closes. What are you supposed to do? Hurry up and run to the other one. Don't make the same mistake twice. Think about that. Don't make the same mistake twice. If you lost one, don't make the same mistake twice. If you haven't lost anyone, hold on to them. Because at that moment of death, if you have this much heart, you're going to remember even when you were seven years old and you closed the door in her face or you conveniently acted like you didn't hear. It's going to hurt. It's going to hurt really bad. Don't put yourself in that situation. And you know, subhanAllah, the moment that I really realized how much my parents meant to me was the moment that my daughter was born. When my baby was born, youth, I especially want you guys to listen to this. When my daughter was born, the first thing I did was I picked up my phone and I called my dad and I was bawling like a little baby and I said, Dad, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> my dad's like, for what? I'm like, Dad, I'm sorry. I didn't realize it. I didn't know. For what? Dad, I'm sorry. And my dad likes, my dad likes to play around. My dad's like, Omar, stop being stupid. <laughs> and that accent. I'm like, Dad, I'm sorry. He's like, was she born? He thought that I was calling to say that there was a miscarriage. Dad, I'm sorry. What happened? She's dead? What happened? 
Is your wife okay? I'm like, no, Dad. I just realized what kind of parent you were. SubhanAllah. That moment when you've got your own and you realize this is going to be a long journey. <laughs> Terrible twos never end, right? It's going to be a long journey. But you know what I especially want to address? Because in this crowd we have a variation. We've got the mama's boys and the mama's girls. Daddy's girl. I was the mama's boy in my family. I was the mama's boy. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I loved my mother. And Alhamdulillah, I never, never, ever in my adult life can remember saying anything displeasing to her. Alhamdulillah. And I only think to myself, I wonder what it would have been like if I would have done the opposite. I wonder what it would have been like. But here's the other thing. On the other side, many of us that are not mama's boys and many of us that are not daddy's girls or those types of things, you know who we are? We're the people that complain that we're not the favorite. Mom, dad, you love him more than me. You love her more than me. You never gave me the same love. You know how you could react to that? Why don't you start doing the things that would make you the favorite child? Stop whining about it. Go do something about it. And that applies to you if you're 10 or if you're 40. Don't whine about it. Go do something about that. Make sure that you change that. Because Allah is not going to listen to your whining on the Day of Judgment. Who's complaining is He going to listen to? Those two. That's who He's going to listen to. And I'll end with one thing. You know, subhanAllah, parents appreciate the smallest things. The smallest things. And the greatest thing that my teacher ever did for me, Shaykh Raja, hafadhullah. When I was leaving my shell, my bubble, after studying for those years, and I asked him for an al I said, give me some advice. He said, listen, you've spent the last few years studying, your mom has barely seen you. Every time you see your mother, kiss her hands. Hug her, kiss her forehead. Every single time. Hafadhullah. May Allah, may Allah bless him for that advice. You know how much parents appreciate those types of things? You know, subhanAllah, you say that to an American kid, go kiss your dad's hand for the most part. That's gross. Are you serious? Back then, they would kiss feet, kiss the hand, kiss the forehead, keep humbling yourself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not tell us to show them the wing of humility while they're still, you know, to lower ourselves and, you know, and humility and show them that mercy while, you know, they're at, where, where, they're, where they're just, you know, getting older and those types of things. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, when they reach old age, when they reach old age, فَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا Don't push them away. Don't repel them. Don't push them away. Don't sacrifice that. And Rasulullah sallallahu made dua against three people. One of those people was who? We always remember this hadith in Ramadan. A person whose parents reach old age while he's alive and he doesn't enter Jannah. That's your key right there. Don't start looking anywhere else. I know I'll end with one thing. When we start talking about religiosity and getting religious and these types of things, we usually think way out here. I'm going to start going to the halaqas and I'm going to start doing da'wah more and I'm going to start doing this and I'm going to start doing that. But what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teach us to start with? Throughout the Qur'an, الْأَقْرَبُونَ أَوْلَى بالمعروف. People that are closest to you should be seeing your best behavior. They should be the ones experiencing, experiencing that really religiosity before anyone else, that change in your life. And when it gets to a point that they mess up, that your parents say something to you, that your parents cross their boundaries, just remember there were times when you did too. And I'll end with one thing, and I promise I'm ending with this, because this is something, subhanAllah, that, that really, really strikes me. You know, if I was standing up here with my little daughter right now, and she wanted a, a piece of candy, and I put that candy in my pocket. And she started to cry. Would anyone in here side with her or would they side with me? Obviously, I'm doing the right thing. But I can't sit there and explain to my two-year-old, look, you know, this is bad for your teeth and your hygiene. And <laughs> this is putting sugar, extra sugar. It might keep... I can't do that. She doesn't know what's good for her at that moment. She doesn't know what's good for her at that moment. And you know, subhanAllah, there was once a greeting card. It's for the 18, 18 year birthday. Uh, it's a greeting card that was specifically from an 18 year old to a father on Father's Day. Favorite greeting card I've ever read. Yes, I'm one of those people that reads greeting cards all the time. I do khutbahs on greeting cards. I'm not even joking. It's an awesome resource for khutbahs. One of those, I'll end in two minutes, I promise, inshallah. What that greeting card said, Dad, 
over the last four years, I'm so glad you've grown up so much. <laughs> you've grown so much over the last four years. What does that mean? You just figured out that the candy wasn't good for you. Your parents, whenever they step in and they say things to you, even when they're wrong, you have to understand that they do it with the best of intentions. And if you're still 23 years old, 20 years old, 18 years old, and you're saying, he's always just trying to get on my case. She always just wants to run my life. He always wants to do this. She always wants to do that. And you're not recognizing the intention. The only thing that's changed is the candy is now the car. The candy is now the dorm room. <laughs> the candy has now changed into another form of candy. But you're still too stupid to understand what's going on. You're not understanding the intentions. Parents sometimes overstep their bounds, but don't ever let shaitan convince you that your parents are somehow against you. And that's why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he was asked about repayment of the father, we know you can't repay the mother, right? But Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi he said that no one of you can repay, and listen closely to the words, his walid. You will not be able to repay him unless you find him as a slave and you buy his freedom. Now, first and foremost, let me give the sharh of this hadith. Walid here can mean either father and mother or it can mean just father. And in my opinion, it's just father. Why? Because you can never repay the mother. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. But on top of that, what was the Prophet ﷺ saying? Your father, and for some of us who didn't have a father, think of the one who did this for you. You know who they say is the only person in life who wants you to be better than them? Your father. Men are extremely egotistical creatures. We're even worse than women in that. We like to accuse women with everything. They talk a lot, but we have a lot more ego. A lot more ego. There's no doubt about that. We don't want anyone to supersede us. But the only person that, that, that wants another man to be better than him is a father who wants his son to be better than him. Than him. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us that sense of mercy, insha'Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who attain Jannah through pleasing our parents and know that it doesn't, this is a relationship that doesn't even end at death because you continue to make dua for them. You are their investment even if they passed away and your deeds will reach them insha'Allah ta'ala. But never forget what they did for you and never allow yourself to be deceived or deluded into thinking that they were against you and they weren't in your corner. And again, the last piece of advice, Kiss their hands, kiss their foreheads, small things, the flowers, doing the dishes, small things, do them every day. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us inshaAllah. Jazakumullah khair for your time. Subhanakallah muhammadika shadu wa la ilaha lant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.